This week, we'll be talking about WrestleMania, Theater Apocalypse, and Rad Stuff. And now your host, the guy who likes WrestleMania and Broadway, Mike and Deglio. What's up, team? Welcome to KM Geekly. Just a sneak peek at two geeks talking about some of the things that got them through their week. I'm Mike and Deglio. I'm joined, as always, by my host, buddy, colleague, and uh, some would say rival at WrestleMania, Keith Farney. I should say the champion of the WrestleMania pool which is uh, new for 2023 and hopefully continuing tradition. Keith Varney. Keith, here we are. We've made it another week. We skipped last week because of festivities, but we're back. We're excited to be here. Uh, How was your week, buddy? You know, it was it was pretty good. I mean, yeah, the reason we skipped a week is because I was actually with you guys in person to watch WrestleMania with you and Jen and your brother and family and uh, had a super lovely time. And, you know, we chose a work life balance and uh, we, we, we lived, we lived. But now you get to hear our thoughts on the entire weekend as well as uh, we we lived this week seeing a bunch of theater. So lots of fun stuff to talk about. I'm excited to get into it today. But before we do that, Keith, we want to thank those who keep the show churning, and that's our patrons. Let Mm. us know who these fine folks are who are body slamming us financially every week. I sure will. And you know what? I'm I'm, I'm neither going to wrap it or crap it. And uh, you'll you'll understand what that means if you've seen last week's Deep Space Nine and this week's Star Trek Toys. Uh, so with apologies, we, our patrons are Brian Kaufman, Casey Clark, Bren Joshua, Andrew Hayes, Jorge Navoa, and the mysterious Worf's Boat Shifts, Richard Coleman, Charles Babbage, CRM Productions, Nikolai Ivanovich Lobachevsky, at Grim Toys, Delusions at Noons, and those people who send us things in the mail include JD Makes, Colin Dagan, Chris Mitchell at CRM, and Pat. You can join them at patreon.com slash KM and get all sorts of fun bonus nonsense from Heathen Mike. So, folks, we've talked about wrestling on the show a couple times. We've talked about, we've had my brother on, a professional wrestler. We've got a new friend uh, over on Look at My Star Trek Toys who also is a professional wrestler sending us custom figures. I mean, the worlds are colliding. Yeah. And speaking of worlds colliding, we brought the theatrics, we brought Kane M. Geekly, we brought Keith Varney, we brought Jersey to Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and we watched yeah. this this year's WrestleMania. We had been excited about the run-up to it. I hadn't watched much of the product coming up to the, the big main event of the year. Keith, I know you don't watch a lot of current wrestling. You're still catching That's up on right. the backlog. But sure am. we all got together for WrestleMania. Uh, it was in L.A. this year was two nights. They've gone to this two-night structure ever since the pandemic. It was two nights. The first night was a little longer. It went about, uh, well, it was almost four hours. And the second night yeah. was a little was a little truncated. We had two big main events, a big, a big tag team explosion, night one. And then, of course, mm-hmm. Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes, the end of a, of a year-long, over a year-long storytelling uh, junket. So we thought, yeah. Keith, what were your overall impressions of WrestleMania? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's funny. Um, you know, as as you mentioned, I, I'm 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 back in 2004 in my in my wrestling knowledge, but I've watched all the pay per views this year, so I had a good sense of what was going on. Uh, yeah, I mean, i I thought it was I thought it was really a, a pretty solid WrestleMania um, that I would have I would have been really excited about, um, except for the ending. Which, which I I understand that was planned months in advance, but I'm 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 a little fuzzy as to the rationale of having Romans retain over Cody. Um, but that said, uh, production wise, it was it was good. It was fun. It was big. Um, there were some great matches in it. I I definitely want to like hear both of our top five matches this year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think night one was spectacular. From start to finish, it was a really successful night of wrestling. It was some amazing matches and was very satisfying. Night two, a little bit messier, mm-hmm. um, and and certainly some some crazy stuff went down. Which, from a production standpoint, um, uh, with uh, with uh, McMahon, a couple injuries, yeah, cu- a couple of injuries, yeah. So you you had. Uh, 
Uh, you had McMahon tearing his quad and then uh, being bailed out by Snoop Dogg, finishing the segment uh, with the help of the referee who helped guide him through uh, throw people's elbow and get us out of the segment. If you ever thought um, that Snoop Dogg was resting on his laurels and was not just a, a genius creative a, a performer, you should check out what he did at WrestleMania. Basically, for those of you who are not wrestling people, just to kind of keep the story going, he was in the ring to hype up uh, an impromptu match between a well-known wrestler and uh, a less well-known wrestler. But if you are in the business, you know he's basically the owner's son who comes out right. during big events and Shane McMahon does some things. Yeah. He's, it's sort of like a nostalgia pop. Uh, but and, 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 and the purpose of this match was basically it's what's called a let up match. So they had a big match and then they had to fill time before the main event. Um, and so it's basically, basically comedy match yeah. to fill time and to give us a breather. It was probably meant to fill three to five minutes. And, but the guy comes out, Shane McMahon comes out and instantly hurts himself pulls his quad, I mean, bad injury. So he goes he down. tears his quad. The like, cameraman don't know what to do because there was a whole seg a whole comedy segment set up. So Snoop Dogg, who just happened to have had the microphone, I, I didn't. I did not, upon rewatching, see him with an earpiece in. So it was not no, like he it, was- No, he's communicating with the ref. Yes, who does have an earpiece. And basically yeah. they still fill the time. They're able to get Shane McMahon, the injured person, a, his injury sort of addressed. They get him kind of out of the ring as they're dealing with him. And Snoop Dogg, just takes over and becomes the main protagonist in this fake match and does some great comedic spots, gets the crowd hyped up, basically achieves all of the bullet points of what they were trying to hope to do in this yeah. little, this let up segment and just did it impromptu. And it was just chef's kiss. It was actually it was, one of my favorite Britain WrestleMania moments. It was so great because, you know, it's, it's improv and, and we're theater people, right? And so, Live theater is live. Mm -hmm. And so when something goes wrong, the set falls down or somebody forgets their cue, you have to keep going. Even if something goes crazy wrong and you have to keep telling the story, you have to stay in character and and do something. You forget your line. Your partner doesn't come out. The set falls down. How are you going to handle it? And many and times, <coughs> many times you it will endear an audience to you. If, if it's handled a million with, times. with grace, yeah. it, it'll stand. And, and additionally, the... It's important, I think, to highlight the the vacuum that's left if you don't address the situation. And in case yeah. in point, if you're watching a show and like a button pops off someone's costume, ninety percent of that audience will stare at that button until yep. somebody moves it. And so it behooves you to gracefully and promptly remove the button, or at least address it. If you flub a line or something happens, if a helicopter flies yep. by, makes if if you have the ability to incorporate it in the show, acknowledge to the audience that you're aware of what's happening. It, it is all success. But these are all things that you don't get taught. It is. No. And, and you have to calibrate it for the tone of what you're doing, right? If you're doing a, a zany comedy, you're doing the producers, you can kind of break the fourth wall and address it and like make a joke about it. But if you're doing like a pinter play, right. you can't, you have to cover it in the tone of what you're doing. And, and with wrestling, you, you don't break the fourth wall. Right, and G so we Snoop generally try not to, yeah. You, 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 so he can't just acknowledge like, oh, well, this is not going how we planned. He had to stay in character. It was great. Really, really liked it. You know, the other thing that went wrong that night that I thought they addressed poorly is uh, in the Hell in the Cell uh, match between Edge and Finn Balor. Uh, you know, Edge threw a ladder at Finn, which is, you know, it's what you do. It's wrestling. But it hit him in the head and and opened up a pretty serious gash on the top of his forehead that could have been a really compelling part of the story. Really, you know, again, you're improving in a different way. There's mm -hmm. a, there's like now there's this injury thing that's unexpected. How do you make that part of the storytelling? But because the WWE is so terrified of losing their PG rating, they cut the camera away from the most interesting thing that's happened all night long. Um, and pretended that what was happening wasn't happening, and it was kind of eggy. And I, I, I think that their, their just like squeamishness about showing any blood on the program that used to have blood all over the place uh, took away from the match profoundly. Well, I think a lot of that, not to get too mired down into this philosophical conversation, but 
it, it, there's been a shift over the past few years, whereas, you know, this this particular art form used to, performance form used to be about the live event that was then being broadcast to a national television. But now it has very much become about the product that is produced after the fact, that's going to be available on streaming, that's going to be packaged to a nice pretty video package or picture. Yeah. So they're able to cut around that stuff, right? And so when that matches, the highlights of that match are shown, of course they're gonna skip the weird cutaways segments. But what suffers many times is the live production on television because they have to cut away from things that are happening and then there's no way to fill time, right? So you see an audience reaction, you know something's going, the announcers are trying to fill that space, but it's not particularly successful. It's, it's, it, it, it's asinine to me because like you're, you are selling this whole thing as it's live, it's scripted, but it's real. Anything can happen. But then when something does happen, we, we try to make it not have happened. Something exciting happened. Yeah. Something Show unique. them stapling his head together. and then Something crazy happened, right? Like, that's why we're here. We're here. Like, otherwise, just pre-tape it, right? It's live. If it's live, have it be live. Show to, us what's live. To go back to our, to our analog in the live theater, it's basically like, you ever hear, you've probably seen the memes of when Patti LuPone flips out at an audience member because they're unwrapping a candy or their phone goes off or something. Right, right. Once you break that fourth wall, I don't care who does it, right? And then try to go back into the show right after, it's a little wonky. The rest of that, the, after Patty does that, the rest of that scene is probably a little weird. You're probably, you're probably a little out of it. You know what I'm saying? So it's, they're trying to juggle that. Now, Keith, I think that brings us to a broader picture you mentioned about night two. Look, it, this product was getting a little bloated. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a Royal Rumble, I think it was, or it might have been the, a WrestleMania. It was like six hours long. It started, the pre show started at six o'clock. It wasn't done until after midnight. It was just too much. You couldn't, yeah. I was fatigued. The people there were fatigued. It was terrible. So they split it into two nights, which is kind of great. It's, it's bite sized. But, you know, Jen, before Jen was forced by marriage to watch some of this stuff, <laughs> she didn't refer to it as professional wrestling. She didn't refer to it as, she just called it WrestleMania because the word, has garnered its uh, it's pop, ubiquitous. Yeah, it's ubiquitous. It's like it's, Kleenex. It's gotten into pop culture, and yeah. so people tie wrestling the the concept of professional wrestling to WrestleMania, and so yeah. they've often programmed WrestleMania not just for people who watch all year long, but for casual people who would just want something exciting to watch on a Saturday night who have no idea what's and and here's the here's what's cool about wrestling in a lot of ways if you have no idea what's happening and you watch a WrestleMania or any pay-per-view really, they, they bring you up to speed real fast. It's not, it's yeah, not great at it. very yeah. deep genre storytelling, right? It's very, <laughs> there's, there's not, the storytelling is not yeah. wildly complex. So you can jump in and then the good guys win or yeah. the bad guys win. It's, it, and yeah. WrestleMania used to be the culmination of all the stories told over the, of, over the year. And it was set up that way this year. There are two main stories, really one main story being told in yeah. two parts, and each part was going to headlight one of the nights this year. And in my opinion, in night one, it, the story was paid off perfectly. They set it up so that the good guys beat the bad guys and everybody feels great. Yeah. Night two, they did the same exact thing, except here's where there's some complication, because this isn't the end of a book. This is this is to quote Triple H, who runs the creative side of the business of the of the product. Used to, Used to. they're got to tell a long game, and there's also a little ego involved, and there's a lot of like financial things. Like there are certain people who sell more merchandise, and there are reasons why certain people are champions, right? It's not just because they're the, the the best fighter, but there's a ton of ton of reasons that go into it that are not just not even story based. And here we have a guy in Roman Reigns who was set up as the bad guy, to lose to the good guy, perfectly set up. Uh, yeah. But for reasons that are bigger than the story, they decided, well, we want to keep the story going, so we're going to keep him, so they don't, so they've swerved and, and, and made a less satisfying ending fictitiously for business reasons. And so even though they they tried to wrap it up and say that it was it was part of the story, it's not. It's... It's business, and that well, left us. Yeah, it was. It's. It. I think it's very unsatisfying for a couple of different reasons. Like I don't. Like I don't think they're going to sell more merch 
with Ro- I mean, like you know, Roman. They've sold their Roman merch. This was an opportunity to sell their Cody merch, and and also because because of you know the the other part of this story, which broke the next day, is uh, WWE has been sold, and Vince McMahon, the guy who started and ran the company the whole time, is now fully back in charge um, after being pushed out because of uh, all sorts of allegations and proven sexual misconduct here and there um he had been pushed out and replaced by paul levinesque i.e triple h who was a former wrestler who did an amazing job telling all of these stories getting everybody invested in the story and now with mcmahon being back and pulling the rug out and going back mcmahon's storytelling is has not been good for a long time and so what a, even even if mcmahon was going to take it back to give Triple H, his curtain call of finishing his story. And now, like, it's not going to be finished in a satisfying way. Of course it's not, because McMahon is chaotic and the storytelling is not good. Well, uh, if, if you want to think of it that way, I mean, if some you I've read some things. You could you could picture that his story is the Roman story. He wants to make it to a thousand days of as champ, and he's the greatest heel ever. And and you could look at it a lot of different ways. I think the the postmortem for me, though, is that WrestleMania as the entity has lost the cachet that it used to have. It is not different than the other pay-per-views. It is one of the same. You cannot Mm. plan on it standing apart and having any sort of satisfying conclusions. Winning the belt belt at Mania isn't what it used to be. It's just, Mm. it's a little less, I think. It doesn't hold the cachet, the weight that it used to have. That's fine. It's just a little, it's kind of a vestige of my, the last vestige of my childhood wrapped Mm. up into this thing professional wrestling that is kind of gone away well it's it's a and and i think you're right and it's both on the storytelling element right with definitive finishes you're you're sort of like culminating the story but also the the production of it the physical production and the scale of the show wrestlemania keeps getting bigger but all the other pay-per-views are kind of matching them now Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be that like WrestleMania would be in a stadium and all the rest of them would be arenas. Well, SummerSlam's in a stadium too. And like, it's all. Uh, I'll quickly it, say like a couple of my favorite bits and then we can move on. I I I'd yeah. like I think that one thing WrestleMania, this card did, which really was heartening to me is that it had a very concise match setup. There weren't too many matches. I think there was about five matches each night. All of them mm-hmm. were, all of them were good. I yep. thought that, some of the matches that people thought would be snoozes, like the the tag team showcase night one, actually ended up yep. being one of the highlights for me. It's really fun, yeah. All of the tag team actually matches were great, which and the tag team division has kind of been meh for the past few years. Right. And also every every woman's match knocked it out of the park. Not a failure yeah. amongst them, uh, which can't be the same for the can't be said for the men. I think the the Brock Lesnar match was kind of a ho hum. I think the the Cena match was kind of ho hum. But for the most part, the, not for the most part, ubiquitously, the women knocked it out of the park. A hundred percent. And that's pretty awesome. And even being able to, you know, there's a little Charlotte Flair fatigue. They were able to still have her do all her stuff, stay strong, and give the belt to Rhea Ripley. I just thought it was just so masterfully which, done. Which for me, the 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 Charlotte Flair Rhea Ripley match was the best match of WrestleMania. You actually Personally. thought the, the two main events of night one, that match and the, yeah. the, the Uso tag team match where they dropped the belts was the two best matches. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. You know, I, I, I think Charlotte and Rhea Ripley was for me, the best match of the whole, the whole time. I he mean, told like a story. It, it was had... an incredible athleticism. I mean, there was the, sh- the, the Seamus match where they all just like chopped each other a bunch the next night, which people are, that was fun. Yeah, it was fun too. A that's, lot of cool stuff. a good one for night two. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. Like, it, I, I think if they'd given it to Cody at the end, I'd feel really happy with the whole thing, you know, with, with little things here and there. But, like, it, it left a bitter taste in my mouth, frankly. But this is the first time I would say, give me a four-hour show and take the best matches of both nights and make it one night. Ah, uh, agree to disagree. I actually, uh, I, I had a good time having, having both nights going. Give me Saturday. Uh, but- I mean, some people work on Mondays, so... <laughs> Not me. I've worked on Monday <laughs> since like 2000. But uh, uh, but uh, it, you know, it, uh, the reason I really liked it, 
It's because I won the picks. Like Keith, Keith won I, the poll. Which I won the picks. I don't care, but he beat my brother, which is saying, which makes my brother a little. My brother's kind of competitive, so that was cool. That was a cool thing to see. Hilarious. We had a Where's great time. Ring? It was great hanging out. I kiss my ring. All right. What's next? Uh, Keith, I got two. Sh- we, so Wednesday was my anniversary. Happy anniversary to my uh, happy anniversary, Chancellor Mike and Jen. Jen. And Chancellor. so we went to New York City to see some plays. Uh, and we started, Keith, I'd like to talk about a little play called The Life of Pi on Broadway. Yes. And uh, this is based on the novel from Jishish. When was that released? Years ago. I remember reading it. Uh, anyway, it was a great, great movie. And then there was a great film adaptation that was done uh, that I thought, you know, a lot of times the movie's not as good as the book. But 2003 was yeah. the novel. Okay. And the movie- oh, 2001. Yeah, and the, and the movie came out in 2003. Yeah. Uh, I thought that the the movie, if not better, was as strong as the book. And the thing about this book that I really love is that there are it, it deals with a lot of it's a it's a very fantastical tale, but it, it really is a waxing on 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 trauma on religious uh, questioning of your own faith and what faith is and whether there really are, should be multiple religions or if we're all just kind of telling the same story with, or the same idea with different stories. It's, it's, it's mm. beautiful. And it's told in this incredible way about a, a really fantastical tale uh, that in, in its most uh, abstracted uh explanation would be uh, a, a kid finds himself shipwrecked on a in the open sea in the south pacific with a tiger i think is the is the the elevator pitch uh, uh, let me quickly say once again i love the book i love the movie uh and i think the performances are very strong the lead uh who is played by uh i apologize if i just butcher his name uh hiran Abi Ascara, he is he is just moving. He's storytelling. He is on stage the whole time. He is just an absolute triumph. But really, the show is stolen by the puppetry. Is just mm. exquisite. They are so committed to each and every little, whether it be a fish wiggling or a tail flicking of the tiger. You, they don't do any attempt to hide the pup, uh, the the puppeteers. Doesn't matter. Just like in your Lion King or your Avenue Q, the puppeteers disappear. Or um, King Kong. Or yeah. King Kong, they disappear. Now, I didn't see King Kong, so I don't want to. I don't want to uh, tr- draw one to one comparison because I, I don't. Awesome. I just don't know. Yeah. Unfortunately, I feel that the 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 scenic design here, uh, the puppetry design, the staging, which is all fantastic, the spectacle of it is absolutely brilliant, and it's not just for spectacle's sake. It does t- story tell. But I find that that the visual storytelling is so much stronger than the adaptation, than the script, than the book storytelling. That there mm. is a, a, there's a gulf between that I couldn't I couldn't gel. Um, it's interesting because walking in to the theater to get our tickets at Will Call, I saw Aaron Sorkin come down the street, and he adapted To Kill a Mockingbird. It's one of the best adaptations. Uh, and Camelot. And Camelot. Yeah. Just. Yeah. There is an art to it, right? To, to somehow condense uh, someone else's work into a new piece of work that carries the same themes. I just felt that all of the nuance and the sort of philosophical plot points were completely lost in this translation uh, or in this adaptation uh, because they wanted to get to the good stuff. They wanted to get to the tiger on the boat and the puppet and the thing. The pacing was weird. It was 45 minute first act. They kept having like commercial breaks where they'd like make a really cool picture with the puppets and there'd be like a big blackout and they'd expect applause and they'd wait and then like another scene would roll in. It was like, it was weird. Uh, And I, here's the big thing for both these critiques I'm giving today. Support live theater. Go see live theater. 100%. On Broadway, it's tough, Keith, because you know, like there are, there are deals to be had like I am a member of TDF, so I got these tickets for forty bucks. We sat right in the orchestra. It was awesome. I mean, for forty dollars, yeah. I'd say go see anything, really. For sure, yeah. But if you're going to drop close to two hundred dollars, as a lot of tourists have to to see a Broadway show, 
some I could see where you'd feel a little bit like they're like, where's the meat on the bone? And uh, I think you, I think this is worth it to see for the visual storytelling. I think there's some things. It's not the Lion King. I mean, these are puppets who you who are ripping apart animals, and you see intestines, and they uh, they defecate, and it's all for storytelling sake. So it's it's some cool stuff. But I was left a little cold by the adaptation. I'll leave it there. Huh, um, interesting. So, so that's my feeling on Life of Pi. But I saw something else I'd like to bring up. That evening after Life of Pi, we went and saw a musical that is kind of uh, killing it with uh, critics and audiences alike. Uh, apparently there's a, a cult following for the show, Kimberly Akimbo, that I did not know existed because there were kids lined up down the street who were just screaming and screlting from- Really? Gitmo. Yeah, just oh, very cool. much super into it. This uh, show is, I want to get the cast and creative down. Uh, I know that Jen, so Jen Sori did the music. Uh, the book and lyrics and the play that it's based on was written by David Lindsay Abair. Uh, I thought that the score was excellent. I thought that the performances across the board were absolutely excellent. Um, Stars Victoria Clark as Kim, and Seth Wiedis, uh is played by Justin Cooley. So here's what I'm going to say. I, find, I, I thought the book was a little, it was great, except for two characters that I felt was like, were, the tone was kind of mismatched. The parents are kind of like really bad people. Yes. Who then, and the aunt, but then at times they give them these ballads where you're like, oh my God, they're learning, they're growing, but then they're not. They like never follow through with that, and so it feels very uneven. You mean well, realistic? No, but it's not. That's the problem. Like at time, oh. you're like, oh, it's gonna be realistic, but then they play them as like mustache twirly villains, and they never, mm. m never meet in the middle to like. So it's it's almost like there was two drafts. They're like, oh, we could do them this way, or we could do them this way, and then they never chose. That's what it feels like. Mm, interesting. Um, but that said, I'm willing to forgive all of that because of heart. The show has so much heart and it has something it's trying to say. And even if it didn't, the performances of the, the, the central romance, there are some B plots and different things happening, being outcasts at school, this, that. But the central, the central show is a romance between this girl with a terminal disease and this kind of outsider kid, Seth, Justin Cooley. And it's so Victoria Clark, who is uh, a mature woman. She's, I think, believe in her 50s, uh, if not mm -hmm. 60s, I, I can't remember. And this young man who's playing a teenager. Well, they're both teenagers in the show. They're both supposed to be 16. Uh, there is no artifice in either performance. Uh, they are, mm. It is so pure and beautiful and wonderfully realized, and the show has a ton of whimsy, and the score is very... Jen Tesoria, I'll tell her this, man. She is a chameleon. She can write any genre of music and have it yeah. be compelling. Uh, the lyrics are pretty quippy and clever, I would say. The scenic design was... Pretty simple, but 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 good. Pacing was great. A uh, lot of magic, just a lot of heart there. And uh, Jen was a bawling, weeping mess. I got there. I was getting pretty close. I just, you know, and Victoria Clark, which is really cool, uh, because she kind of stands apart in this uh, this this show. She has a completely universe different vocal type than any of the kids who are all just kind of like pop belting, right? And, and it works perfectly both thematically and also musically they find a way to gel it. And I just think it's it's just there's a lot of heart and magic there, which is something that can often be lost in the commercial theater, as you know, Keith. And so uh, there's no reason. And I don't know if the show is selling because it's always on TDF. It is always on TKTS. There are always rush tickets available. So you have a plethora of chance to see this show. Oh, I should go see it next week. So you should absolutely check it out. Um, Definitely, definitely worth taking it, taking a peek. Yeah, awesome. That's not, that sounds good. You, you've you've got me sold. I I I got I got to renew my TDF membership. I haven't done that in a long. It's so good since before the end times. Both tickets we got for forty dollars, and we sat dead center orchestra each time. Phenomenal. All right, I'm gonna get on it. I'm gonna get on it. All right. So uh, interestingly, that very same day. Uh, I I went with uh, with Jillian to go see uh, my uh, brother and sister in law in a new show called White Girl in Danger, and this is <coughs> Michael R. Jackson's follow up um, 
<coughs> excuse me, to his Pulitzer and Tony winning musical. Um, and uh, he actually wrote this one first. And this is a, a show that uh, Eric and Elise have been working on for about a decade now. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I obviously I'm very close to this show, so I'm not going to be particularly unbiased about it, but it's hilarious and uh, very moving and very eye-opening. It's, a, it's this crazy story set in the world of bad soap operas, mm. um, which are incredibly white focused mm -hmm. and uh all of the uh the background characters are usually of color but the focus is always on these ridiculous white characters and so it's a story about these these background characters taking back the storyline taking back the 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 center stage and it, it is unbelievably hilarious and ridiculous and body and um you know it's it's aggressive it is right there in your face um but uh, you know, a, a, Elise plays one of the one of the. They're all like high school kids. Um, one of these ridiculous characters, and Eric plays th the boyfriends of all three of the of the uh, in the in the white characters, and they're absolutely hysterical and ridiculous. Um, and it's super fun. And then it goes. We we go on this journey, and then all of a sudden we're in this other place. Mm. And um, I don't want to give away too much. But we we travel really far and really amazing. Um, so without getting you know too far into it, I I do want to point out that uh, on top of people that <laughs> other than people I'm directly related to, there is a star making breakout performance in here uh, playing the character of Nell Gibbs, Tara Connor Jones who is somebody who uh, this is her off Broadway debut. She was in Jacksonville. And so she, and she plays the mother of our protagonist um, uh, who was played by Morgan Simone green um, who plays Caroline. So the mother of the protagonist now it's so hard to explain what this part is, um, but she starts off, you know, she's in the background as the mother and she plays a whole a succeeding um succession of black stereotype characters in it before taking over her own story. This is a performance uh, that will be like when the reviews come out, it's going to be a big deal. Her performance, she sings the bejesus out of this score. She's hilarious in so many different ways. She's heartbreaking. It's really exciting. So I'm really exciting for the world to see her in this performance. Um, That's because cool. Because it what's the blue? How long does it run at second stage? Uh, it runs at second stage for uh, another few weeks. It opens this week. Okay. Um, so you can see it at second stage. It's a it's a co production of it's off Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, it's a co production of the Vineyard Theater and Second Stage. Um, let me see when it uh, when it closes. It is running through May 21st. Oh, okay. so you've got another month and a half. It might get um, extended. It's it. hard, to, hard to say. It, it 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 will probably extend. And, you know, I would be surprised if it doesn't transfer up. Oh, um, great. But, we need uh, that. kind of stuff it, we need. If you can get in there and see it, uh, it go. Uh, it is it is definitely, it is an eye-opener. It's hilarious. It is it is every bit as bold and brave Um as uh, Strange Loop was, um, but this is much more uh, funny. I mean, Strange Loop was funny, but this is like really funny all the way through. So uh, definitely check it out. Michael R. Jackson's White Girl in Danger. I should say, you know, if it, hopefully if you're anywhere near New York, check out these shows. Any of these shows, anything running, really go see. I mean, Phantom's playing its last few things. There's talk of it maybe just transferring off Broadway, which wouldn't surprise me, but Bob Fosse's no. Dancing just opened. Who? who who, wait, wait, who's talking about bringing Phantom off Broadway? I have, I have, I have a couple of the, uh, how can I say it? Someone who had heard some things that they had been talking about, maybe shopping it to like a, uh, one of the Hot smaller nonsense. places. Okay. Hot nonsense. All right. Um, <laughs> that, is, that, that is my professional opinion. Phantom will never play off Broadway. My Here's my, here's my semi-educated prediction. It's going to be closed for about, two or three years before they do a giant revamped revival. 
You look. You're the man who works. You work for the uh, the the rags. So you uh, you have much more insight. I just heard a thing but, from a, from a but if it shows up at New World stages, I will eat crow. But I will be very surprised. Uh, this, the, I would say this is the only person who, who I got this info from someone who had who had leaked the the grow ban info well well before it was it was known. So they 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 have their ear okay, to well, people talking about for it. for sure. So I'm sure. Yeah, be- Let me tell you this. I would imagine. Everything is being considered. Nothing's off the table. Uh, well, that's probably true. Yeah. Um, as it as things go, I mean, bad Cinderella's a real thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you read those reviews? But wow, just Woo! just that's silly. Anyway, so see live theater, and if for some reason you can't, I highly suggest that you go ahead and check out. Uh, where's the thing? Uh, there's all kinds of musical stuff happening on your on your streaming device right now. You got Rise of the Pink Ladies yep. on Paramount Plus, which is like a Grease prequel thing, which we watched the first mm. episode of. It was pretty good. You got the new season of Schmigadoon, and which is awesome. Jackie's in that, right? Yeah, Jackie's the principal. It's it's fun. It's fun. Shot really well. Uh, but that's not what I want to wow. talk about next. Yeah. There's some damn there's some damning fate. It's right? just like how do you like you got to this whoever was tasked i don't have the guy's name uh, who was tasked with writing cuz there are 10 50 minute episodes and there are like six original songs in every episode so wow they can't all knock them out of the park there's some cool stuff we we enjoyed our time for sure okay all keith right. what do you got that's rad for me this this week well i you know what it's uh, it's it's very simple but uh it was rad staying with you and jen this weekend yeah it was it was really fun to see the family and you know in in uh, in first person and uh, get to hang out with your cats mm-hmm. and we we ate some good food we had some good conversations we did all the stuff uh, it was a it was a lovely trip down we uh, ate a cinnabon as big you as your head we sure did yeah uh, so uh, yeah I mean the rad thing to to have the luxury of being able to see the important people in your life to have the uh, the, the luxury that is, you know, uh, vaccines and such, which allow us to to do that and, and have a more post-COVID life. Uh, it was a, it was it was really fun. I enjoyed it. So, you know, one thing we talked about in one of the first episodes of Geekly that we haven't really revisited lately is is some music. Yeah, Keith talked about his album last week. Hopefully you've had a chance to check that out. Uh, my wife and I were listening to it in the car after you mentioned it because we hadn't revisited. I hadn't revisited it until I listened to it on the subway. I was still living in New York. Uh, but so I was like, I want to listen to me- some more music. And I very much stick to my lane when it gets to music. But I wanted to kind of check out what the kids were listening to. So I, uh-huh. I did some reviews. Or I did I read some reviews, and I was like, what are some popular albums right now? But I wanted to stick in the kind of the indie singer-songwriter vein because I was inspired by listening to Keith Varney's Momentum. Nobody more indie than that. So I checked out two popular albums. Um, and, oh, let me get... Uh, the first I'll talk about is a kind of a, an indie songwriter super group keith if you will um uh, it's a band called boy genius and it is uh a, a collaboration between three really kind of coming into the mainstream now but they were sort of underground before singer songwriter women uh lucy dacus uh, julian baker and um oh my god i'm forgetting Hold on. Eartha Kitt. No, turns out no. Oh, it's Bug. Clarence She's... Thomas. No, 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 no. Come on. F- uh, Phoebe Bridges. Oh, boy. Um, very popular right now. Anyway, uh, and they, they had released an EP, and then in the interim, they have kind of become a little more well-known individually, so they released this record uh, this month, in fact, just a couple, or a couple of days ago. Long story short... Keith, music is in good hands. This is obviously well produced, as a lot of music today is. Incredibly well produced, well mixed. The instrumentation, the arrangements are all very good. But more importantly, these three women can can write a lyric. There is some just a personal, mm. touching lyrics, and it feels. It, what's really great about this project is that it, it feels much more cohesive than you would think by taking three individual singer-songwriters and kind of just sticking them together. They really ebb and flow with one another. They work nicely on each other's tracks. They're willing to kind of take a backseat 
and let it know, they each take turns taking the front. So this record is getting rave reviews. You don't need to hear it from me, but absolutely worth a spin. It's the record by Boy Genius. Absolutely. And it's pretty mellow. It's a pretty mellow record. I also checked out Lana Del Rey's new record. Uh, this is called Did You Know There's a Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard? I, I just thought Lana Del Rey was a teeny bopper. I guess I'd heard the name. I didn't really know much about her. She's kind of had a trouble. I, didn't, I just hadn't, haven't followed who Lana Del Rey is. But I checked out her latest release because it was, it was popping up on a bunch of lists. Holy crap, Keith. <laughs> this is basically like someone having an existential slash depression, depression episode. It's dealing with a lot of personal themes, some dealing with grief, dealing with stardom, dealing with, but none of it coming, talk about deciding to just undo the zipper and write with total authenticity. It re it, the, the lyrics read almost like a, a diary. Mm. And, but somehow it, it's somehow done poetically and the lyrics all kind of scan. And the songwriting is really, really, really specific. So specific that it forces you to personalize as we talked about last week, a little bit, great record, incredibly mixed, wonderful performances. The, the arrangements and the lush orchestrations, absolutely Worth it, and a long, long project, about an hour. These are two records that demand to be listened to in a sitting, uh, not just put on a on a mixtape, which is how a lot of music is produced today. So that's my weekly rad. Uh, music's in good hands, and it's okay to step outside. Even me, I would consider myself a pretty, uh, pretty broad tastes, to listen to what not to just scoff and yell at kids to get off your lawn to recognize that they're very talented and, and making some great music and so i was happy to know that i'm not completely old and and angry keith i can still get into the the popular kid tunes so that's my weekly rad check out those albums it sounds good yeah are you gonna listen to good. lana del rey tonight keith i i i i can't say that i can guarantee that i won't <laughs> let you let me let me go <laughs> hey listen we wrapped it all up in 45 minutes uh we had a lot to talk about we thank you for joining us hey you know we talk about other shows oh this is a podcast are you sick of our faces i am mm. you don't have to endure them anymore catch k and m geekly on all of, basically i'm talking to keith's mom here uh birdie mm. told me that you you, you want to listen but you, you don't want to watch it on youtube Available That's on right. all of your podcast listening places. Just search K and M Geekly, and we're there. All kinds of episodes, twenty-five episode backlog, and everything moving into the future. Also, check out our other shows. Keith and Mike watch Deep Space Nine, and you've got to look at my Star Trek toys this week. We're looking at some really cool customs. Go figure. Uh, so that's all the stuff. Like and subscribe. Leave us a super chat comment tip. Whatever you tend to do, uh, just remember to, uh, what's the tag for the show? <laughs> hey, you know what? You no matter so what good. happens this week, no matter who comes to arraign you, don't let mm. anyone yuck your yum. Keep on doing the things you have fun. You have, uh, Keith, you want to take it this week? I can't do it. <laughs> Thank you for watching. We will see you back here next week with all of our usual stuff. And keep on geeking on. <laughs>